Thank you very much. And sorry about that setup. I have like the least technical presentation today. So of course, I had the most technical problems getting my computer working. So you know, I tried to make it nice and easy, but you just, you know, technology. I love it, and I also hate it. Um, so yeah. So oh, right. I have this thing. It makes the slides go. Big secret. Um, so yeah, so my name is Laker, and I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work that I do with young developers on our platform. But really, it, I think that it extends to all development, and really to pretty much almost any industry, if you really, really think about it. My magical button thing's not working, so I'll just be over here. And so just to give you kind of a little roadmap of what we're going to do today, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a who is this guy, I'm going to talk about some of our developers talk about some of our experiences working with them. And then last, I'm going to wrap it up and kind of talk about you know, maybe what you can do with your community and some people that you know. So to start off, my name is Laker. Um, I am always hesitant to give out my title, as we saw, uh, Manager of Information Experience. No one knows that, uh, what that means. That's OK. My title changes all the time. Basically, the gist of it is that I teach kids how to make games. That's really the long and short of it. I started as a full stack engineer, but then realized, you know, I'd rather teach people how to code than to do it myself all the time. Love coding, but only in small pieces. I'd rather, I'd rather teach people how to do it. And the company I work for is called Roblox. Um, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Uh, the trick is if you have someone young in your life, like a nephew, niece, son, daughter, chances are they might have heard of this. Um, yeah, we're a gaming platform. It's primarily aimed at kids, although we like to think that we're for all ages. And the beauty of our platform is that we try to take all the heavy work out of doing, making games. Um, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with game development, but there's a lot of things that are just a real pain in the butt. Things like networking, physics, um, you know, just managing servers, so much of that just gets in the way of starting up a new game, starting up a new project. And we just realized, you know what, why don't we just do all that work for people so that they can just focus on the gameplay, focus on the experience. And what's really nice about that is that because we take all those little technical aspects that you usually need lots of years and years of experience doing, we just cut all that out. And it leaves a really nice, simple shell that people can work with. And it really lines nicely with kids because they don't have to do all these fancy things. They can just hit the ground running within like five minutes. If you want to see this in action, we actually have a workshop tomorrow where we're going to literally do that with kids. They'll just have games up and running really quick. Um, and technically, full disclosure, we aren't actually JavaScript, so I appreciate you all welcoming, welcoming me to your, uh, to your community. Um, we do do Lua, which is also scripting, but not quite the same. It has its own fun, fun little quirks. But anyway, I didn't really want to talk too much about Roblox. Specifically, I did want to talk about our developers, um, because they're a pretty unique bunch. Um, they're like a lot of people that you probably know. They're very passionate, very talented, very driven, but they're also very young. Um, because we're a platform that's primarily aimed at kids, a lot of the games on our platforms are played by kids, you know, 9, 10, 11, and they suddenly get this kind of real realization moment, um, usually when they're kind of like in middle school and they're getting a little more tech savvy. They're playing all these games on the platform and they realize, oh, these games were also made by kids. Maybe I could do that too. And so they often start off being like, OK, well, let's just dive into this. And again, we try to make it very simple for people to get started. You don't have to learn, you don't have to learn about you know, a big fancy game engine. You can just get a project going on day one. And so they'll just experiment. They'll just try things. Uh, a lot of these kids are self-motivated, self-learn. They try to just recreate games that they see or just recreate little mechanics. Or they'll reverse engineer uh, you know, something that they've seen. And so they're a very interesting bunch, and I really like working with them um, for lots of reasons, and I'm, that's mainly who I'm going to talk about throughout this talk. And I want to start off by just giving you a little case study just to kind of paint you a picture of kind of one of our, one of our typical users. Um, so this is Brandon LaRouche. Uh, he started very young with Roblox. I think he was probably about like 10 or 11. Um, he played with his brother, his twin brother, actually. It's weird. I know a lot of twins on Roblox. It's the weirdest thing. And they all come in pairs. Like, they don't do it individually. They all do it together. Um, but yeah, he started with his brother. And again, it's this classic story that I told you. He just started kind of playing games. And then he realized, oh, there's these really easy development tools. I guess I could probably do that. And he didn't start off fancy. He didn't try to make Skyrim or anything like that. 
He just, you know, made little, little platformer games or just made little tiny game mechanics. Um, again, just try to recreate little things of what he saw. And from that, he actually realized, like, oh, I really like software development. I really like coding. And it really kind of just jump-started his career. And again, I want to emphasize very, very early. So he took that, and he went beyond Roblox, although he's come back to Roblox since. But he explored all kinds of software development because of this initial spark. He explored making uh, mobile apps. He explored making websites. Um, he even wrote books. And again, I, wanna re I can't emphasize this enough, young. He wrote two books by the time he was 15. I don't know what I was doing when I was 15. I don't know what you were doing when, was, when you were 15. I'm going to guess that you weren't writing books. And this guy published two, which just blows my mind. It's, it's amazing. And also, like, his apps. Like, he's made apps that have, like, 650,000 downloads. Like, again, that, that's not something that I did when I was 15, 16. But there he is. Um, and yeah, and really what's kind of neat about Brandon is that I was fortunate enough to work with him. He actually came for an internship at our company, and then we liked him so much that we just hired him pretty much on the spot. I mean, we have to wait for him to finish school. But he's so talented from, again, just kind of jump-starting really, really early. He didn't wait to finish high school or college to you know, develop his skills. We're, you know, when he's joining our company, he's not going to be a junior level because he is basically the technical lead on our development website. He started that up when he was an intern, and we contracted him after it stopped. And so amazingly talented person. And what's really cool about what I'm talking about today is that there are lots of Brandons out in the world. Just kind of wanted to paint you a picture of one of them. But there are lots of them that we work with. And so to kind of segue from that, I want to talk about some of the programs that we do. And again, this is sort of gives the context of how we work with these developers. So we have two programs that we run on site in our offices down in San Mateo. Um, by the way, yes, I'm from California, and I'm really glad that it's not smoky up here. It's a really refreshing change. Um, yeah, so we run two programs in our offices, um, and they're both essentially mentorship programs. We have what are called our incubators and accelerators. Difference isn't too important. Um, basically, we bring these kids on site to you know, give us some plat direct platform feedback because they're domain experts on our platform. So we want to make sure they can talk with engineers and say, hey, you know, it'd be nice if we could fix this. It'd be nice if we had this feature. But the other really big part of these programs and what I want to focus on here is that we give them mentorship and guidance. Because really, the theme of what I want to talk about today is that there's lots of these young developers out there who are really gifted and talented, but they're lacking in some just kind of real world expertise. A lot of them, again, are self-taught, self-motivated. You know, they you know, watch videos on YouTube. They read tutorials. They just kind of try things out. And a lot of times, they'll come to us as sort of lone wolves that are like, yeah, I've dabbled with everything. I've learned a lot. But then they don't really know how to take that to the next level. They don't know how to achieve like, their vision of creating a game or making an app. In our case, it's pretty much exclusively games. But again, it, this applies to pretty much anything. And so, yeah, when they come to us, we really just kind of kickstart them through development of their games. You know, we sit them down, they make, we make sure that they have a plan, make sure that they assemble teams, make sure that they're prototyping. Again, just all these things that maybe not, may not be super obvious to a developer who's just starting out, but something that you know, we as industry experts can kind of impart upon them. And to kind of, kind of show you some of the things that came out of this, um, here's just three titles that happen to be on our platform. And um, just to give you some context, across these three titles, there's more than 2 billion gameplays across all three of them. It's just, again, just blows my mind the success that some of these young devs have. These are all people like half my age, and it's just, it's, I don't know. I just get flummoxed. I can't talk about them because they're just so amazing. So yeah, and again, so we work with these kids on site. And so now I want to just talk about you know, some of the learnings that we have and like how, we, how we work with them and how we guide them and how we mentor them. And again, giving the context that they're all really, really young. So kind of one of the first lessons we learned very early on was not trying to tell them what to do in terms of like make this game, implement this thing, do it this way, use this tech. We definitely tried that early on. We were like, hey, you know, let's, let's try to have you make this game. We had a very heavy-handed approach 
in all aspects of their development, from the design to the implementation. And you know, we 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 met a lot of, of resistance. I think that if you if any of you work with kids or you know work with almost anyone really, no one really likes to be forced to do what to do. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be forced. Rather, they you want to be guiding people. And so that's kind of what we shifted towards was instead of telling them, hey, here's the games that you should make, we instead try to just inspire and guide them. Um, one of the classic stories I like to actually tell about this in terms of not forcing is that one of our early, early folks, in fact, the person who made that game on the far left, Meep City, he came in, he pitched a game to us. He's like, oh, we're going to make this game. You're going to just socialize. You're going to hang out with your friends. There might be some mini games. You might make a house. But really, it's just kind of this social hangout thing. And a whole bunch of veteran gaming people looked at him. They were just like, that's never going to work. Do something else. Make this other game. He did it. It was OK. And then he came back and made Meep City. And again, this was a game that we said, hey, don't, you know, this game probably is not going to work. But then it did. It's super, super popular. It's one of our top games on the platform, and it has been for like over a year. So again, kind of the lesson we got from that was, you know, the people that we're working with, these young developers, they have a dream, they have a vision, and they also really understand these new audiences as well. And so really what we're looking to do with them is, again, not tell them what to do, but just help them reach their goals. So in terms of inspiring, you know, really what we do is we try to help them refine their ideas. So kind of the example I like to use for that is one of the very first things we'll do with um, kids when they come join these programs is we talk about their game pitches. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but quite often you'll hear there's a term called an elevator pitch where you have to try to exploit, boil your game down so that if you're talking with someone in like two minutes, you could convey what it is and they could kind of buy into that. And we took that a step further and we we're saying, okay, Typically, I usually hear, like, say, like, do this in two minutes. We tell them, OK, you've got 15 seconds to sell me on your game. And you know, it's a tough challenge. They, don't, they can't do that right away. They have to work on really boiling down and distilling their game's mechanics to the real core of what they're trying to do. Um, and it's a big challenge, but it really helps them think critically about what they're trying to do. Because well, quite often, if you just sort of let these young developers loose, they have a million ideas that go in a million different directions and they just spaghetti all over the place. And by kind of just saying, hey, take a step back, just think critically about what you're doing, it really helps them focus and get started on the right foot. And we kind of carry, on, carry that through the whole process. So that goes to you know, thinking about their game mechanics. You know, don't try to do a billion things. Try to really hone in on a couple really core, nice things that you can execute well on. And and it applies to all areas of their design too. You know, their interface, their environment design, um, just their just their game mechanics. Because really, once they do that, then they can arrive at a really nice, clean idea and execute on it. And then another thing that we try to help them do, again, as I said, a lot of these kids will come to us just again, having done this all on their own. They, you know, just you know, were in their bedroom and they just were hacking away. And that's great. They learned a lot. But I think, as you all know, any project of any kind of significant size, even smaller projects, you really need to have a team. You can't do it alone. And that's a thing that a lot of these young developers don't always necessarily understand. You know, sometimes they'll be work, working with their friends and whatnot. But by and large, the pattern that I've seen is that they're, they're trying, they think that they can do it all, and they try to do it all. And I definitely encourage people to touch all different areas of development. I mean, that's what I did on my journey. I was a full stack engineer and learned very quickly about the areas of development that I didn't like. So I definitely like people exploring. But I do want people to kind of understand, you know, what are the areas that I'm really passionate about? Because when you have that sort of intrinsic motivation, when you love what you're doing, it makes it that much more easy to be successful and, you know, make your projects work. And so the things that we'll do with these teams is we'll help them understand, okay, you know, what are the things that you're good at? What are the things that you enjoy doing? And the things that you either you know, don't enjoy doing or don't think you have the time for, you know, let's help you figure out how to form a team around that. How can you, you know, hire artists? How can you collaborate with other coders? You know, a lot of these kids haven't worked with any kind of you know, source control or versioning or anything like that. So collaboration is a really big learning for a lot of these young devs. 
And then, you know, just even things in terms of leadership and just the soft skills involved with working with other people. It's not all just tech. You know, you have to get along with the people that you're working with, or if you don't get along, you have to figure out how to not work with them. And, you know, I, I'm glad that I don't have to do this, but some of the other people who work with these kids who are a little bit more closely involved with the program, you know, they're dealing with just drama and situations because, you know, they're just dealing with humans. Um, these are things that you have to learn. And fortunately for these developers, they're learning it really, really early. And the other thing that I kind of want to make sure that you sort of take away from this, because this was a big thing that we also wanted to, that we also had to learn so, somewhat the hard way, is you know, thinking about diversity in term, in your, for your developers and the kind of people that you're looking to attract. Again, I'm not saying, suggesting that all of you go out and start a mentorship program and recruit 50 devs to, to work for you. You know, this can go, you know, be as large or as small as you want. But, you know, when you're working with anyone who you think has kind of that fire, that spark, that vision, that person who could really be encouraged to grow into a developer, um, you know, there's sometimes I've noticed in the industry, I mean, at least this is true for gaming, so I don't know if how widely it extends, but I imagine it's pretty true for software. There's this kind of celebrity persona of like a hotshot developer, like a rock star. And, you know, when you set up programs to like, attract people, like, yeah, let's get the best of the best of the best, you know, we'll advertise like that. We're like, we're looking for the next new stars. We're looking for hotshots. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, there's two things wrong with that. One, um, you know, a lot of people just don't self-identify that way. Um, you know, when you're asking about that, you're asking for sort of like a personality type rather than a skill set. And, you know, just a lot of people that you know, I've worked with through this program, they don't think of themselves as like celebrities in the programming world. You know, they just want to work. They just want to learn skills. Or they want to do a certain project. And, you know, that's something that we had to learn and we had to, to work to diversify our teams was to say like, okay, you know, let's not focus on like trying to get the best of the best of the best. Let's try to get a big range of people because they're gonna give us, you know, not, they're gonna give us a really good wealth of feedback too because they're coming from so many different areas of expertise. And so, you know, we look for people that not necessarily are like top of their field, but we try to find people who really have drive and have passion and look like they're really gonna stick with something. So not someone who, so we'll definitely accept people into our programs who aren't, you know, may, maybe they have a lot to learn in terms of like technical skills, but they've shown that they're like, yeah, you know, I've you know, got a lot to lear learn, but I've worked on this game for three years and it's my passion project. We're like, that's really cool. We wanna help you overcome whatever things are stopping you from, from making it. And so, you know, by focusing on, you know, the passion and the drive, you know, you help out these people because you're setting also setting them up for expectations of, you know, we're going to focus on not, you know, boosting your ego and making you feel really cool, but we're going to help you do really cool things. And that's just going to help you get a bigger range of people too. Just the talent pool is much wider if you, you know, think about just, you know, you know passion and drive, I think. And so, um, you know, where, what, what to do with this? Um, again, as I said, I'm not really fully expecting anyone here to you know, set up big programs. Um, I think that this can work at scale at pretty much any level. You know, so if you do work with some kind of like developer relations team like I do, you, know, you can probably you know, do some sorts of mentorships, you know, either in person or virtually um, you know, at large scale. But it can also just work with one person. You know, if there's someone in your community, someone in your family, a friend that you know, um, you know, I think that these sorts of lessons about, you know, just teaching them how to realize their dreams instead of just saying, you know, hey, you want to be a software engineer, just do this project, this project, this project, you're done. You know, really help them explore the ideas that they want to do and help them think through the problems that they're going to encounter facing that. Because, you know, really there's so many people and so many different ideas that we're not going to be able to help them. We're, you know, they're just going to come up with all kinds of things that we'll never think of. And the things that we can do as industry experts and as veterans is we can you know, help them just understand what the stumbling blocks will be and help them understand um, you know, what, what challenges will, will get in their way. 
And so, you know, that's, that's very good for like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship thing. And then, you know, also there's never been a better time for people to just get started as well. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I was saying, you know, don't do like a heavy hand and do this project, do this project, do this project. And that's true, although I do think, you know, when you're very, very, very green and new, it is nice to have sort of project-based learning to kind of help you get started. And there's lots of great resources for that. You know, Hour of Code is a really, really big thing now. Um, you know, lot, and th there's just a huge wealth of camps, programs and stuff that, you know, particularly kids can get involved with to get started. But again, I definitely want to make sure that, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, if you again have like a young person in your life, you're like, okay, there's this cool camp that you can go to, here's this cool class that you can take. I want to make sure that, you know, you help them think about, again, just the things that they're trying to make and not just say, hey, you should go to this camp because learning programming is good. You know, we're going to the future. Everyone's going to need to know some kind of programming, which I think is true. But, you know, help them understand why that's important, especially if they do, you know, play games or if they do like, like some app on their phone or if they do like some website. They're like, man, it would be really cool if, you know, I could maybe make that. Help them understand, yes, you actually can make these things. You know, these things were made by people just like you, and you can get there. And all you need to do is just give them the tools and kind of sort of the guidance to make that happen. So, um, and yeah, i am got a little bit of time left, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty much out of slides. But um, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure being here.